All right, Lance, you're, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, so it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dana Sackett. Uh, Dana was born in Baltimore, where her interest in aquatic life was first stoked with trips to the Baltimore Aquarium. She received a BS in Marine Sciences from Stockton University in New Jersey, followed by a master's from Rutgers and a PhD from North Carolina State University. Uh, Dr. Sackett has turned the challenge of being a military spouse into opportunity, finding numerous postdoctoral research opportunities during her many short deployments in a long list of places, North Carolina and Hawaii and Georgia and Kansas and Germany, and I've probably missed a few, but, but now in Northern Virginia, uh, her research focus uh, in fish ecology, but in particular in aquatic toxicology. And so she has had studies uh, investigating endocrine disruptors in North Carolina surface waters and the impacts of polyfluorinated compounds on reservoir ecosystems, and especially studying the sources and risks of mercury contamination in fish. Uh, initially in North Carolina as her doctoral work, and then more recently in Hawaiian bottom fish. Uh, she has been working or has worked with Dr. Jeff Drazen at the University of Hawaii, where she investigated the effectiveness of deep water marine protected areas as a management tool for the protection of ocean fish populations. Uh, along the way, she and other grad students uh, created the fisheries blog uh, using popular articles as a means of outreach to promote aquatic sciences to a general audience. And the site has grown since its inception in 2011 to reach up to 20,000 readers a week from up to 40, or excuse me, 90 countries. Uh, and currently, Dana is developing a multi-year project with Dr. Drazen to examine the potential impacts of deep sea mining of precious metal nodules on the structure and function of marine ecosystems in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and she recently joined the ENST uh, faculty as an assistant research professor, and I look forward to working with her on this exciting new project. Well, thank you very much, Lance. Um... And I just want to check my internet is looking spotty on this side. Can you guys hear me pretty well? Uh, at the moment, yes. Excellent. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, yeah, my, my career has kind of been a little bit um, parsed around in different areas of the world because of uh, being a military spouse. And so that I like that it has given me the opportunity to work in these different places. Um, but for today, I want to share with you some of the work that um, I have done with um, Jeff Drazen um, and others that Lance was just talking about here. Let me see if I can get my screen up here. All right, can everybody see the screen? Looks like it's trying to load here. Get you guys. You know if you got it. It has, it's, it's trying to load. It's attempting. <laughs> it, it says, this is what? it says you have started screen sharing, but it doesn't, it's not showing up quite yet. It's not, let's see. I can retry and see if I can get it back up again, but. Okay. Everyone should know we had, we had this working earlier. It was, we did, we did practice. I know we had this working just before. <laughs> Everybody got on here. Yep. So let me know as soon as you can see it. I might try to stop sharing and then try this again. Let's see if we can get back up here. Okay. Of course, when you tell it to click a bunch of times, it will just get more mad at you. Um, but let me see if I can get. I think this is what happens when you have everyone in the household on Zoom. Oh, yeah. yeah. Let me see if I can get you back. Well, I think I can get started without it, but I think my computer is kind of now freezing up. So in a pinch, maybe you can email it to someone. Um, and we might be able to, to run it from this end. Looks like we've frozen here. <laughs> 
Yeah, if she wanted to email it either to you or me, Lance, I'd be glad to run it. Or... I'm not sure if she can hear us to know that. Yeah, it looks like she's sort of locked out right at the moment. Maybe she's. Oh, okay. Now she's back in the waiting room. So. Uh... She's using PowerPoint 2016. She can output it as an independent presentation. Then she doesn't have PowerPoint in the background taking back bandwidth. Yeah. Hey Dana, are you back with us yet? Okay. So you're back with us. So let me uh, go ahead and put me back as the. Uh, so everyone's yeah. got to be in anticipation now. <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna. <laughs> okay. So I just made you co-host again. Okay. So let me if, share the screen. If we run into any troubles, we were saying while you were tuned out. Uh, if as a backup, you could email it maybe to one of us, and we'd be glad to run it. Okay. Let's see. So it's saying again that you've started screen sharing, but. It, okay. Well, not, fingers crossed. Well, let's see if I can get this. Would you like to email it to me? Yeah, I definitely can. In the meantime, just in case it does not come up. Let me. Anything coming up? It's not, it's not loading yet. No, it's just showing the, uh, so that you started screen sharing. We, well, I saw this beautiful title slide. Everyone should know. I saw this beautiful title slide of fish. And <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I know it's there. Disconnected everything. Okay. All right, let me see if I can uh, get the, the no, email. No, we got it. Yeah, it's, I see it. Yeah. Oh, you got it up? Yep. You're okay. good. Yes, success. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to apologize now for maybe powering through some slides <laughs> just in case we're starting to run out of time towards the end. Um, in any case, um, so today I, I just want to talk about some work we've done um, with the co authors I have listed here and that Lance had mentioned and how we had used isotopes to kind of trace this biogeochemical history of mercury that ends up in fish tissue. Um, and much of this work happened out in Hawaii, but I'm also going to be talking about some preliminary results mm -hmm. that uh, Jared Crisp and Troy Farmer are, and I are doing right now uh, in Mobile Bay in Alabama and in the northern Gulf of Mexico. So that's going to be the premise of the whole talk. Um, but I want to start off by giving um, some background information and actually quite a bit of background information just to get everybody onto the same page in terms of how mercury ends up in fish in general. So it starts off with emissions into the atmosphere. Um, this comes from natural sources and anthropogenic sources. Now our natural sources make up about 10% of global emissions whereas our anthropogenic sources make up the rest. So close to about 90% of those emissions into the atmosphere. Their natural sources come from things like volcanoes, weathering, whereas though it's anthropogenic sources are coming from mostly coal fire power plants, um, as well as some other industrial sources. Now the forms of mercury um, are important to know as well, particularly for what I'm gonna talk about today. And so I'm gonna go over those as well. Um, First, the elemental mercury, this is an inorganic form that is volatile. And so that means it will go up into the atmosphere. Um, 
And not only does it go up in the atmosphere, but it can actually travel really, really far distances in the atmosphere, in the atmosphere before it falls out. Um, and so what's important about that is you can have sites that are really far from any source of mercury, and yet they're still contaminated with mercury because of this elemental form, because it can travel so far. Um, and the majority of those uh, emissions from natural sources are made up of these, this elemental form of mercury. For anthropogenic sources, and I'm going to generalize a lot here, um, but what comes out of smokestacks is about half of that elemental form that's volatile. And the rest of what's coming out are these other forms here. And can you guys see my little cursor on the screen? Yes. Give me a little like thumbs up if you can. Okay, good. Um, so that's, so this guy right here, this mercury with the two next to it is oxidized mercury. And then the little P mercury is particulate mercury. These forms make up about the other half of what's emitted and they're considered heavier forms. So they'll fall out of the atmosphere much more quickly. Um, now, when it falls out to the atmosphere or from the atmosphere to the earth, it can happen generally in two different ways. And so we have our dry deposition. This is just when mercury lands on stuff. So the land, water, trees, um, surface uh, of vegetation, things like that. Whereas wet deposition is when it rains, that rain will basically scrub the mercury out of the air and wash it into water bodies, your rivers, your lakes, things like that. Um, and it's important to recognize that because of this wet deposition, rain events are often considered um, in our, to cause influxes of mercury or loading events of mercury to these aquatic systems. Now, all the forms of mercury I've talked about so far um, are toxic, as are all forms of mercury, but they're not the forms we are as concerned about. The kind that we are most concerned about is the organic form. That's uh, and a specific type of organic form called methylmercury. Um, this is the form we had fish advisories for. It is um, very neurotoxic and it's bioavailable, meaning it can enter the food web really easily. And the primary organisms responsible for this methylation process of taking this mercury from this oxidized form to its uh, to its organic form of methylmercury are these sulfur and iron reducing bacteria. They're the primary guys responsible. There's also a number of factors that are uh, important in terms of affecting this methylation rate. And so dissolved oxygen is a big one. So if we have low dissolved oxygen conditions, this usually supports much higher methylation rates by these bacteria. Um, and that's largely because these bacteria that are responsible for this process are um, anaerobic bacteria. And so they work best under these low oxygen conditions. Um, another thing is pH. So more acidic water will often support higher methylation rates as well. Um, and part of the mechanism behind that is that uh, mercury, whether the organic or inorganic form can bind up with uh, dissolved organic carbon and other dissolved organic matter and be transported pretty easily. But if the system has aquatic or uh, has acidic water, that, uh, that mercury can become disassociated from that dissolved organic carbon and then more available to those um, bacteria that do this methylation process or for methylmercury, um, it's then available to enter the food web. And so once that methylmercury is made, when it does enter the food web, and if it does, it enters at the base, um, at your primary producer stage, and then it bioaccumulates um, up the food web to these higher concentrations in these uh, top trophic level organisms. And so you see this increase in mercury with trophic position because of that. Um, you also see increases in mercury with the age of organisms. So as uh, they age, they accumulate more mercury over time. They also take much more in that they then they eliminate over time. And so they have these really long retention times of mercury inside the body, um, particularly for fish. We also see increases in mercury with the size of fish. And that's again, driven by the fact that we have these higher trophic level, older fish that are usually your biggest fish. Um, and then the last little bit um, that's important to know is that human exposure to methylmercury is almost entirely through the consumption of fish. And so that's why we focus on mercury and fish tissue quite a bit because it helps uh, us uh, understand the risk to consumers. And then also that nearly all the mercury in fish is methylmercury. Um, and this makes sense, this is the bioavailable form. And for this talk in particular, that's important 
um, because I will um, constantly just say mercury and fish. Um, and when I say that, I'm really referring to methylmercury because that is that the form that makes up uh, what's in the tissues. So I know I've given you this kind of very linear step by step by step process through the mercury cycle. But as you can imagine with most things, uh, it can be a lot more complicated. Um, and a lot of the complexity for the mercury cycle in particular comes from the fact that each one of the transformations I just talked about can go backwards. And so for instance, you can have this elemental mercury be deposited in the water um, and, uh, and you have that oxidized inorganic mercury in the water, which can then be reduced often by sunlight in a photochemical process back to elemental mercury. And then it's volatile, so it goes back up into the atmosphere. You could also have that inorganic mercury in the water be methylated by bacteria, which can then go into the food web, or it can go backwards and be demethylated by either by other microbiota or by sunlight in a process called photodegradation. And so again, this can make this cycle very complex, especially because the conditions in the water, in the sediment, in the soil can all affect which direction these reactions are going to go. Um, and so with all this kind of complex cycling going on, as you can imagine, it's pretty hard to predict where the mercury that ends up in our fish is coming from. Um, and so that's something that we were really interested in, is seeing if we could, despite all this complexity, figure out where the methylmercury was coming from. Where is it being converted and then entering into the food web and then ultimately ending up in the tissue of these fish? Um, and one way you can kind of figure that out is by using these isotopic tracers. Um, things like nitrogen and carbon and mercury, which they get through the diet, gives you information about the food web. And as a result can give you, sorry about that, can give you information about the base of the food web in particular, and thus where that mercury is coming from. Um, which, and there's two main in terms of like what, uh, why do we care factors? Um, there's two main ones, one being mitigation. Um, we wanna know where the mercury is or the methylmercury is being produced that ends up in the food web uh, because it gives us a potential dial we can turn to reduce uh, the amount of mercury making into the food web. So I'll give you an example. If we know that the sediment um, has uh, low oxygen conditions periodically from nutrient runoff, and that is where this mercury is being methylated that's ending up in the food web, then we know that we, we can reduce those uh, nutrient loads. We could reduce periodic hypoxia or anoxia and likely then reduce the mercury levels in the food web in that system. So that's one way uh, or one reason it's important to know this stuff. The other is because we have changing environmental conditions. And so having information about this cycle and where the mercury that ends up in that fish tissue comes from can help us understand how the mercury is gonna change over time. So that's all my, uh, the reason it's important um, soapbox. But talking about these individual isotopic tracers. So I'm gonna explain how each one works and why we kind of use each one. So the first one we use is nitrogen isotopes. Um, nitrogen isotopes are used by lots of different ecologists to kind of figure out where uh, in the food web an organism or species exists, so what trophic level they are. And the reason we're able to do that is because um, different isotopes of an element are often used um, in chemical processes in such a way that one form is usually used preferentially over another. And the one that's used preferentially is based on their mass. So if for instance, we have a light form of nitrogen here because it has one less neutron. And we have a heavy form of nitrogen because it has an extra neutron. Um, now that light and heavy form uh, during a chemical process, this lighter form will be used preferentially, which means at the end of that chemical process, you'll have a different ratio between the heavy and light than you started with. And so in terms of a food web, this means that when a predator eats a prey, it then uses the nitrogen from their prey when they digest it and break it down. They'll use this lighter form of nitrogen in their metabolic processes and lose it to waste while they retain the heavy one, um, the heavy form of that isotope. And so what that means is that we'll have an increase in the ratio of heavy to light nitrogens with each step in the food web. And one way we measure this is this uh, delta 15N 
um, and we use units of per mil. And it's basically a ratio of the heavy to light nitrogen um, and in comparison to a relative standard such as atmospheric nitrogen. And so to give you an example here, we have a food web and then you see this enrichment with each step in the food web of about 3.4. That's an enrichment in the heavy form of the isotope, okay? Now there's one limitation to this process though, and that's that you have to know what the ratio is at the base of the food web. Um, unless you're looking at a closed system that's just a lake or a pond, um, and all, you know that all your organisms are in the same food web. But if you're looking at different systems, you have to know what that ratio to heavy to light nitrogen is at that base um, to know where your starting point is. Because otherwise, for instance, in this food web I'm showing you, the one to the right and the one to the left have different starting points. If you looked at the absolute value, you would think that the dolphin and the state have the same trophic level. But once you adjust for that baseline, you would know that the state actually is about a step lower on that food web um, than that dolphin. So there's a way to get around this because it's a really a big challenge to know what the baseline is in an open system such as the ocean. And, uh, and what we do to get around this is to take the tissue sample of the fish and take the protein sample and break it down into the individual amino acids that make up that protein and look at the nitrogen ratio for each one of those amino acids. And the reason this is useful is because some of those amino acids will fractionate, meaning that one isotope will be used preferentially over the other as you move up the food web, whereas other isotopes or uh, amino acids, sorry, um, known as source amino acids, such as phenylalanine here, um, that's the purple line along the bottom, these don't fractionate as they move through the food web. And so they have the same ratio of heavy to light nitrogen as they did at the base of the food web when it started out. And so having that information just from a tissue sample is really useful for these open systems. It's expensive, but it's also really useful. Um, having that source nitrogen is also really useful to give us information about the base of the food web. Because if you have a source nitrogen value that's um, much higher, you know that that nitrogen Nitrogen came from a more nitrate rich source that fed the food web that your organism is in. Whereas if it's a much lower or more negative number, it's more likely to be a atmospheric source of nitrogen that fed the food web that your organism is in. So we can give you this information about the food web as well. Carbon is also really useful in terms of understanding the base of the food web for the organism you're looking at, just by looking at the ratio of heavy to light in the tissue. Um, again, because it doesn't fractionate once it's in the food web. Um, so it tells you what it was going on uh, or where that carbon sort of came from that fed the food web that your organism is in. And some things the carbon isotopes can tell you is whether your carbon source was from C4 or CAM plants or from C3 plants. Um, and the reason, the mechanism behind this, not to get into the weeds, because I know we're running a little late, um, but it's, it's just kind of interesting. So your C4 or CAM plants, because they've evolved to be in more um, dry or drought ridden areas, they have this cool enzyme that allows uh, the plant to basically capture a bunch of carbon dioxide really efficiently from the air. And then they close up their stoma, which is those little pores in their leaves. And when they do that, then they have a finite amount of carbon dioxide to do photosynthesis with. So they wind up using up the light form, which is what they prefer. And then when they run out, they use up the heavy form as well because it's there and they're not um, refreshing that pool that they have because they don't wanna open it up and lose uh, water to the environment. And so what that means is they get more enriched in this heavy form of the isotope because they're using this finite amount that they grabbed while the stoma was open. The three plants on the other hand, open up their stoma much more frequently. And so they're continuously replenishing their supply of carbon dioxide and can preferentially use that lighter form of carbon um, and because of that, they have these more depleted values um, or lower values. They're depleted in that heavier form of carbon. And so that's really kind of a neat way to be able to distinguish where your carbon source is coming from um, that feeds the food web that your organism is in. Now, these carbon isotopes can also tell you whether your source is coming from a benthic algae source or phytoplankton. And this has a similar mechanism um, because of, uh, but the, the reason behind it is the diffusive boundary layer. And so your 
benthic algae will have a much larger diffusive boundary layer around it. That's about one millimeter or larger. And so because of that, again, the carbon that gets in there isn't resupplied very quickly. And so a benthic algae is limited by this finite pool of carbon dioxide that's in that bubble around it. And it has to it uses up the light form preferentially, and then it runs out and uses the heavy form. And so because of that, it has more of this heavy form incorporated into it. Whereas your phytoplankton has a, um, a diffusive layer that's orders of magnitude smaller. It's like one micrometer. And so it's able to replenish that light form of carbon and it's carbon dioxide that it's using to do photosynthesis. And so it's able to have this much more negative or um, value that's depleted in that heavy isotope. And so because of that, it all comes down to the fact, all that explanation is to say that these marine um, phytoplankton will have value values of carbon isotopes, negative 22, whereas your benthic algae source of carbon to the uh, food web will have values closer to negative 17. All right, last bit of explanation on isotopes, I promise. Um, so for mercury isotopes, these things are kind of cool. Um, I nerd out to them a little bit because there are seven different isotopes and they do something completely different than a lot of other elements. Um, they do mass dependent fractionation, similar to what we just saw with carbon and nitrogen, but they do this separate thing. The odd isotopes in particular, the 199 mercury and the 201 mercury, they fractionate independent of their mass to each other. And they do it only when a photochemical process occurs. And so, so when sunlight basically causes a mercury that, um, either inorganic mercury, oxidized mercury, or, um, sorry, letting someone in, um, or the methyl mercury um, is being photodegraded, will these odd isotopes fractionate? Um, so that's really kind of uh, a neat result because not only does it occur, but it occurs in a very predictable way when you're measuring the difference of that fractionation from mass dependence. And that's what this little arrow with this triangle right here is. These lines represent um, these equations from lab experiments that Berquist and Bloom did, um, showing mass dependent fractionation and then the difference um, that occurred with these mass independent fractionation. And what's really neat is the differences that they were able to measure were really reliable and they were even specific to the type of photochemical process. So whether it was the inorganic form of mercury being reduced or whether it was methyl mercury that was being degraded. Um, and so what does all that mean? That's, that's a lot of, I know we're kind of in the weeds on that, but let me show you if I can get it to go forward. Come on, don't slow down. There we go. So what that means is that we can take 199 mercury, our odd isotope, and our 201 mercury, our other odd isotope. And when we regress them, if we have a slope close to one, that is indicative of a type of um, photochemical process that occurred to that mercury that caused it to fractionate before it got into the food web. And so again, a slope of one suggests that mercury underwent fractionation that was dominated by going between the elemental form and this oxidized form back and forth before it went into the food web, okay? You'd expect to see this if the mercury um, or if the system that mercury is in the in the tissue of the fish is really conducive to methylation. Um, and I say that because that means this uh, oxidized mercury, when it got in, into the water or was deposited into the system in the fish that you found it in, that it turned to methyl mercury and then immediately went into the fish. And so it didn't go backwards once it became methyl mercury. Values closer to 1.2 in this slope suggest that the process that occurred that fractionated that mercury before it entered the food web was dominated by this process where this yellow arrow is. So the mercury basically being methylated by biota or bacteria and then being demethylated by these photochemical processes and the back and forth process there before again, it entered the food web and ended up in your fish. And I wanna show you how reliable this relationship is. And I'm gonna show you three different sites or data from three different sites from colleagues 
across the world, very different sites. We have the North Pacific Subtropical Gyre, middle of the Pacific Ocean, lots of sunlight, um, San Francisco Bay, less sunlight, um, and an estuary area. And then the Northern Gulf of Mexico, what I would consider like an intermediate to these other two in terms of sunlight and influence from freshwater and uh, terrestrial sources. And so what you see is despite these being really different environments across the globe, this relationship between these two odd isotopes is really strong. You don't usually see field data from such widely um, different ecosystems have such a strong rela relationship. Um, so it's kind of cool to see that. Also notice that each of these slopes are very close to that 1.2, which suggests that that type of photochemical process that occurred to the mercury before it entered the food web was driven by that going from that inorganic oxidized mercury to methyl mercury and back again before entering the food web. So that was the type of photochemical. And I want you to note that I have these little suns next to um, the, uh, the odd isotopes, just to remind everyone that those isotopes are specific to that photochemical process. All right. Let's see if we can get that moving. There we go. Um, now, the other thing, the even isotopes of mercury do your typical mass dependent fractionation. And so what's really neat is you can compare these even, this 2O2 mercury to your odd isotope. And in doing that and regressing them, you can get the relative amount of photochemical versus microbial processes that occurred to that mercury before it ended up in the tissue of that fish or in the food web. Um, so again, really neat that we're able to do this. Uh, now, if you have a slope value close to 2.43, it suggests that all photochemical processes drove the transformation of mercury before it entered the food web. If you have a slope of zero, just a flat line, that suggests that all of the microbial or all microbial transformations dominated the transformation of mercury before it entered the food web. All right, and showing you those three sites again to give you um, an idea of what this looks like for these different e ecosystems. Out here in the middle of the Pacific, you have this value or slope of about 2.27. So that's close to that 2.43, which suggests that it was dominated by photochemical processes, which is what you might expect in the middle of the Pacific Ocean um, with a lot of light penetration into the water. And so you can actually estimate that um, approximately 7% of the fractionation of mercury before it entered the food web was driven by microbial processes for that ecosystem. Looking at San Francisco Bay, we have a line that's much closer to that zero slope, um, suggesting that more, in fact, about 95% of the processes that fractionated mercury before it entered the food web was driven by microbes. Okay, and you can see, again, I have the sunlight here representing that the further you are up on this side of the graph, photochemical processes, and the further you are along the bottom of the graph, um, you have these uh, biotic or uh, um, microbial processes occurring, and that's why that little petri dish with microbes in it. Um, and then last but not least, we have the Gulf of Mexico. This is, uh, has a value uh, slope of about one, which is intermediate these other two, as you'd expect, with approximately 60% uh, relative um, of the processes that uh, fractionate mercury before it enters the food web um, being driven by microbes, okay? So all of this is to set the stage for our studies um, moving forward that we did. And so our goals was to build on these other projects um, and be specific about looking at those species near um, coastal waters, okay, or in coastal waters. I mean, coastal waters are where uh, a huge portion of our fisheries exist, uh, basically the fish that end up on dinner plates. Um, and they also are areas where you have the potential for these organisms to be exposed to numerous different sources of water. So coastal waters, you have the potential of freshwater runoff, you have benthic sources of mercury, you got open ocean sources of mercury. We're not really sure if we can figure out um, the mercury that's ending up in that tissue, where is it actually coming from? And so we wanted to try to do that, which brought us to um, the area around the Hawaiian islands. So our specific objectives for the Hawaii project were to try to um, figure out the sources of methylmercury that ended up or bioaccumulated 
in um, these marine coastal benthic species. Um, but also to look at that movement, if we could figure it out, among mercury from fresh water to coastal and marine ecosystems. And then we also wanted to provide insight into this marine biogeochemical cycle. If we could really piece together the pathway of mercury um, ending up in the tissue of these fish. And so to do this, um, I have my schematic here. We have the potential of freshwater methylation runoff, coastal, benthic, and then um, for those that aren't familiar, there's an area in the ocean known as the oxygen minimum zone. It's just an area where sinking detritus and dissolved organic matter reaches a depth where um, microbiota aren't degrading um, those nutrients and eating up the oxygen in the water. And so there's a band of low oxygen between about 300 to 1,000 meters in the middle of the ocean that just has low oxygen. And in that pelagic study uh, in the middle of the Pacific, they found that this was a source of methylmercury to their food web. Um, and so we wanted to know if that was the same for our benthic species as well. So to do that, we have benthic species. We chose these species because they had distinct depth uh, zones in which they existed um, that were different from the others. And we wanted to know if these uh, differences in their distribution also uh, contributed to different sources of mercury in their tissue. For each of these individual, um, I should mention they're all economically important to um, their important food products, particularly for those that live out in Hawaii. Um, but we did a suite of measures. So lots, all the isotopes I've mentioned and total mercury as well. Um, we also, because we're measuring total mercury in tissue, we wanted to make sure that that was representative of methylmercury. So we verified with the subset and found that, yep, 99% of the mercury in that tissue was methylmercury. All right, so jumping right into our results, checking out my time. Um, <clears throat> what we saw was, uh, again, looking at our odd isotopes, which tells us what type of photochemical process dominated um, the fractionation of mercury before it entered the food web. Um, you can see our Hawaiian bottom fish, which are, which are in red. Um, all the other data from those other sites are still in here, so you can see where they fall relative to those other areas of the world. But what you see is, again, this value close to 1.21. So again, the type of photochemical process that dominated was the demethylation of mercury by sunlight, so photodegradation and then the methylation by bacteria. So that is what drove photochemical processes before it entered the food web. Looking at the relative um, amount of photochemical versus microbial processes that impacted this mercury before it about one. This is pretty close to what we had in the Northern Gulf of Mexico. Um, the main difference being that the line is shifted up compared to this line that there was more of this photochemical um, degradation of mercury before it entered the food web. Um, uh, another thing I wanna point out before I move on to the next slide is this uh, line from the Pacific Ocean. If you remember very little um, microbial processes affected those fish in the middle of the Pacific that were sampled. And I tell you that because our next slide um, looks at those specific species from the Pacific Ocean um, or the middle of the Pacific. So this gray scale is from this other study that looked at these Pacific um, open ocean species. And what's interesting from that study is they found that there was a signature of a lot of photodegradation occurring in surface waters for those shallow water species, what you might expect. But what's interesting is there was a decline with depth. So you can't erase the history, photochemical history of mercury. And so if this methylation was mainly occurring in surface waters and then that mercury was just sinking or being bioinfected in prey to deeper waters, you'd still expect it to have that same surface water signature, but you don't. And so what that suggests is that mercury is sinking through the water column after it's deposited and not being photochemically degraded. Uh, and then once at depth, it's actually being methylated in that oxygen minimum zone. So a really cool result for that, those pelagic species. But what's cool for our bottom fish species is we see a similar result, which suggests it has a, a similar source of mercury. And so where our shallow species have this 
uh, more photochemical processes occurring and our deeper species have uh, less. So this deeper water source of methylation occurring. Um, so that was really interesting. In terms of the biotic um, contributions to our, uh, to our species versus those pelagic species, we saw a lot more microbial um, degradation occurring to the mercury that ended up in our fish than in those pelagic fish. We see a similar trend, um, but we see much wider values as well. And so what this kind of showed us was that this mercury, while a similar source to those pelagic species, was likely being incorporated into the benthos um, instead of directly into the food web, where it was undergoing more microbial processes before entering into the food web. Um, and so that was a really neat result to discover. Um, there is this one fish in our shallowest system, um, or our shallowest fish, uh, giant trevally, that had a signature that was just off the wall. It was completely different than the other species, um, and it was really wide ranging. So a really wide range of values for one mercury and for two O2 mercury. And so we really wanted to know about why this would happen. And so we uh, looked at our carbon values and what we saw was for all our other species, they had what we would expect, which is about a negative 17 carbon value. That is very, very indicative of benthic algae being a source of carbon to their food web, which is what we expected based on diet data and other things. But here our giant trevally again has this very different signature. Um, in fact, it has a signature that um, suggests that terrestrial C4 or CAM plants are the source of carbon. There's also a possibility there's a certain shallow estuarine sea glot grasses that can have this signature as well, but they, uh, they are not prevalent around Hawaii and the few that are there are declining. And so uh, we thought, well, maybe it is C4 and CAM plant runoff. Uh, and it makes sense because Hawaii, they have two dominant crops um, or agriculture, and that's sugarcane and pineapple, which are a C4 and a CAM plant. And so what we think we see here is evidence that it is terrestrial runoff from these agricultural areas um, that are supplying the carbon to the food web that giant trevally is in. All right. And looking at our source nitrogen data kind of back up this information as well. Um, when you have values less than about uh, negative six or so, that suggests a more nitrate rich source of nitrogen that's feeding the food web. And again, suggesting most of our species are benthic, so we'd have more nitrate rich, but this shallowest species uh, takes that to a bit of an extreme with much, much more nitrate rich sources of nitrogen feeding its food web. Again, suggesting that it's this agricultural source or runoff that is, is feeding that food web that giant trevally is in. When you put all of this information together, we're able to piecemeal um, the pathway of mercury that's ending up in these fish. And so we see that with similar to pelagic species, we have mercury being deposited in the surface water. We have this signature suggesting that um, shallow Aloe water species have mercury that has undergone more of these photochemical processes, whereas uh, those deeper species have a signature that shows it did not undergo additional um, photochemical processes, but instead uh, was methylated at depth. And then we also see that it was likely incorporated into that benthos where it's getting its food web, its carbon, and that mercury is undergoing additional microbial processes before entering the food web. And that's true for all these bottom fish species, except for our giant trevally, which, um, which is seen to get its mercury sources from terrestrial runoff, um, <clears throat> which is important because giant trevally are an important prey species to a number of large marine predators. And so this suggests that they're actually bioinvecting terrestrial sources of mercury into the marine food web. It gives us a kind of another piece of the puzzle on how mercury is cycling uh, through these environments. So I'm, I'm going to kind of run through um, our last bit from uh, Alabama. But um, the reason we went to Alabama is <clears throat> in looking at this study or finishing any study, it kind of leads you to more questions. And the end of our uh, Hawaii study really led to the question of what are these influences of freshwater sources of mercury on these coastal fish? Um, and can we even distinguish between different freshwater sources of mercury? And so we thought, well, the best way to, to look at that is across a salinity gradient. 
Um, and so that takes us out here to um, Northern uh, Gulf of Mexico, specifically into uh, Mobile Bay in the Northern Gulf of Mexico. And so in terms of across a salinity gradient, this is kind of a blown up version in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen here that shows that that salinity gradient over two days in June. This full seawater. And so you can see that's across that estuary. Now, lucky for us, Jared Crisp, our recently graduated master's student, these economically important species, these are um, species that end up on the dinner plate. Um, that are also reliant um, on um, estuarine environments as well as marine environments. Um, and so what he was trying to do, they use this estuary during their growing period um, in the summer and fall where they're using the estuary. Um, and in doing that, trying to understand and uh, which habitat specifically contributed to the adult population and the fishery. And so that really dovetailed nicely into our project on mercury because not only are they economically important, but they're dependent on the estuary. And they have, because they move to the marine environment when they become adults, um, they have the potential to bioinvect mercury to the marine ecosystem. And last but not least, because with Jared's study, he's providing the individual fish um, across this salinity gradient, which can give us more information about where their sources of mercury are coming from. And so there were three different contingents um, of southern flounders. So there was a contingent that was called transient that used freshwater and estuary and habitat um, to mature and grow before moving back out into the marine environment to overwinter as an adult. There was an estuarian contingent that used just the estuarian habitat over its life history to grow uh, and mature before moving into the marine habitat. And then there was a freshwater contingent where these juveniles would move into freshwater, use that freshwater environment to grow and uh, mature again before moving into the marine environment. And so something interesting from their study is when independently sampling um, the freshwater environment, they largely found those fish that spent their life history growing and maturing in that freshwater environment. In the Bay Area, when sampling, they found mostly uh, fish that had, um, had life histories that, that where they spent that time in that estuarine environment. However, for fishery dependent studies, now these are the fish more likely to end up on a dinner plate, we found that it's actually the transient fish that make up the, a really large portion of the fish that end up in that fishery, okay? So that leads to these objectives um, that we had for Mobile Bay, which is again, to look at that biogeochemical history and see if we could figure it out across the salinity gradient to refine our technique to see if these different contingents and basically the different use of these habitats could lead to different sources of mercury in those fish. And then to see if we could look at specifically those transient fish that are ending up in the fishery, what are the sources? Uh, where is the mercury coming from for those particular fish? And so we had our Southern flounder um, across the board. These results are preliminary and we're still looking for uh, data to come in, but you can see we only have two transient individuals right now. So we're looking to get more. We measured the same suite of isotopes in total mercury. Um, also take note of Weeks Bay, this one fish here, um, because it becomes an outlier later. But uh, I want you to note that it has these tributaries that are surrounded by agriculture um, that have tannic acids, which makes the water really acidic. And because of all the agriculture in those tributaries, the Weeks Bay itself can have these periodic episodes of hypoxia. And so as you might imagine, low oxygen, low pH, likely to support really high methylation rates uh, for mercury. And so just to run through these results, you've kind of seen this up before, this is the type of photochemical process that occurred. You should note right away that our Southern flounder, which were in red compared to these other areas around the world are all clustered down by the zeros. Um, this suggests that there was very, very little photodegradation that occurred for this 
um, for these species in the estuary before that mercury ended up in the food web. And this value close to one, if you remember from the beginning of this talk, um, it suggests that the photochemical, the type of photochemical processes that impacted the mercury before it entered the food web was driven just by um, trans, uh, transformation between the two inorganic forms. So from elemental to oxidized, which means that when that mercury became methylmercury, photochemical processes didn't really turn it back into the inorganic form. It really became methylmercury and went right into the food web. Just more evidence that the system is really ripe for methylation. Um, <clears throat> and then looking at our comparing photochemical versus microbial processes, we see again a line. Um, however, note that those uh, data points are shifting to the left compared to the San Francisco Bay. And, uh, and that's uh, evidence and more recent uh, studies have found this evidence that those negative values suggest a pathway that is more conducive moving towards methylation rather than demethylation by microbes. So just more evidence, the system is really set up for methylation for these species. When we look at our individual contingents, we see that we likely have different sources of mercury for these different groups of fish as well, uh, depending on their life history and how they use the estuary. With these freshwater contingents having uh, mercury sources that undergo less photodegradation than our estuarine fish. Also note that our transient individuals are just outliers. We need more data on them. We just uh, can't really explain um, the results for them, other than Weeks Bay here, which is this point down here that based on these values, I've, I've never seen a value this low before for mercury isotopes, but it, it suggests that the mercury kind of in this fish was deposited, methylated, then really didn't undergo much additional processes, just went straight into the food web. All right. So using an equation by Berquist and Bloom, um, we can actually put the numbers uh, or the proportion of methylmercury that's lost to photodegradation rather than ending up in the food web to an actual percentage. Um, and these are our areas across the world again. I'm gonna be quick with this, but just pointing out that fact that Mobile Bay, very little mercury is being lost to photodegradation, suggesting that it is likely ending up in the food web instead of being lost to photodegradation compared to these other areas of the world. And that holds even when you look at these different contingents with less methylmercury being lost for these freshwater individuals, these individuals that spend their life history growing in that freshwater environment versus that estuary environment. So our next question would just be to say, well, losing less mercury to photodegradation, does that result in actual higher concentrations for those individuals, um, particularly freshwater individuals? And so far, I can't tell you a yes or a no. I can tell you that previous studies have um, found that freshwater individuals or those individuals caught in freshwater environments do have higher mercury concentrations than those caught in estuary environments. But based on our data so far, um, we can't tell. We're still in preliminary stages of looking at it. Although it may be um, because we haven't controlled for confounding factors at this point um, that we don't have a result. So for example, I have our graph over here with the size of the fish, we have the trophic position, and then mercury along the bottom. And what you notice is there's this group of large, high trophic level fish that are in this upper corner with high mercury. And if you uh, control for that or get rid of them, you can look at these fish that have more, uh, a group of fish that have similar trophic position and total length. And then you kind of see how freshwater fish, these pink values do fall out more on the side of higher mercury whereas our estuary and fish fall out on the side of lower mercury. Um, and so again, we need a lot more data. Um, and we, once we get that data, we plan to run models where we can control for some of these confounding factors. The so last is showing the source nitrogen and carbon values. You can see again, this story where the, depending on how these fish are using this estuary over their life history, they have very different food webs in which they exist, where they're getting different sources of nitrogen and carbon. Um, the carbon values here in particular are indicative of the C3 terrestrial runoff um, being the carbon source to the food web and also nitrate rich across the board um, for both groups. So with that, I just 
want to um, wrap up, revisit these objectives for Mobile Bay that I talked about um, earlier. And basically what we can say is in Mobile Bay, there's across the board very little uh, photo degradation occurring before this mercury enters the food web. These conditions are really ripe for methylation. Um, when this oxidized form of mercury is deposited in the system, it seems to be um, converted very quickly to methylmercury and then very quickly uh, entering the food web. Um, and this has important implications in terms of consumptive fish advisories, because any additional loading of mercury to the system is going to result in higher concentrations of mercury in the food web. Also, freshwater residents, because they do move offshore, are going to be bioinfecting that terrestrial sources of mercury to the marine food web. In terms of refining this technique, we do see that transient fish and that really unique signature, which I'm interested in knowing if, um, if we can find that Weeks Bay, those fish that do uh, mature in Weeks Bay, have a very specific signature that is specific to that area. And then also that we were able to use this nitrogen, carbon, and mercury. Um, we were able to refine the technique to demonstrate that different uses of habitat by these fish over their life history did result in different sources of mercury. And then last but not least is we need more data on those transient fish because those are the ones making it into the fishery and therefore are most likely, uh, like most likely going to be consumed by people. Waiting on data for that. So I know I kind of ran through a lot of that. Sorry about the technical difficulties in the beginning. Um, but thank you to all of the funders and the people that have helped with all of this work. And um, thank you guys so much for listening to me ramble on about Mercury for an hour. Uh, I'll take any questions you have. And I'll make sure we can send out my email. So if you have additional questions, and I know we're close to being out of time, um, you can send them to me. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, I enjoy this. Great. Well, th thank you so much, Dana. This thank was uh, very interesting, very challenging. To, um, and uh, But I think we can uh, still take time for uh, a couple of questions before we wrap up here. Um, uh, if anyone has a question, they can, uh, they want to put in the chat box. Uh, this would be a good time. Um, I have a question that's a little bit tangential that you, something you went across on the front end, and I don't know whether it really, that you can tell me more about it, but I was interested that your, your comment about that the methylation process was driven by these sulfur and iron bacteria. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in those sulfur and iron bacteria, but I, I never thought about them as sort of being involved much in this mercury process. Yeah. And so they're usually the ones, there, there are additional types of microbiota that are responsible for this. And they're finding there's a specific gene that uh, particular bacteria have that do this methylation process. But it is sulfur and iron reducing bacteria that are given um, the most responsibility, I'd say, for these processes um, uh, of methylation. But. Okay. Um, anyone else have a question they want to throw in here before we? Um, I was just going to ask about um, ocean currents and yes. in terms of the Pacific Basin, you know, like right now they're talking about La Nina and of course El Nino's and um, do those impact sort of that overall uh, mercury distribution in, in the basin to have those, those big kind of big current issues? Yeah, and that is a great question. And we've actually tried to get some data um, before I left Hawaii to start looking at that because we don't really have a good answer for it um, currently. And I, I mean, it would obviously depend on the different areas of the world as well, um, whether you're close to the coast and you're an upwelling area or, um, or just like in the middle of the Pacific, such as uh, in near the Hawaiian islands. Um, but we don't, we don't know how, how that might influence um, mercury and how it's cycling and, and getting into those fish. One thing that has been suggested, particularly since we know that this oxygen minimum zone is a source of methylmercury to these food webs, um, with climate change, we know that that oxygen minimum zone is expanding. And uh, with ocean water becoming more acidic, we're likely looking at um, a future where methylation is going to become more efficient. Um, 
So those species that the source of their mercury is coming from that deep ocean source of methylation is are likely to, to start seeing increases in those values and concentrations over time. But, yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, but that would be a cool study to really to look at the impact of El Nino, especially since they're likely to be happening more frequently. Um, yeah. So, Vane, if I jump jump back in here, so do I understand what you're suggesting is that the that the, the the sources of mercury, because think they're transported so far and wide, that the the sort of the mercury that sort of gets into the food web and and into you know edible species and that sort of thing is driven more by the these sort of transformations in in particular environments than it is from the sort of local sources of mercury from or? the loading. Yeah, and so that's that's what something that in can change. So you could have a system that's not very conducive to methylation occurring, um, say it is not very acidic and, and the mercury can be remain bound up with organic matter and just be buried in the sediment. And you can have loading occur and it's not likely going to translate to much higher levels in the actual food web because um, that methylation process, in other words, it's going backwards, that reaction towards demethylation mm -hmm. likely more than methylation. Whereas if you have a system like we saw with Mobile Bay where those conditions, um, water quality conditions are so ripe for methylation that it's likely that any additional loading, water event, throwing a coal fire power plant nearby, um, you're likely going to have this direct um, relation uh, to that mercury making it to being methylated and then into that food web. Um, and so, like I said, it's, it's really dependent on, on these different areas um, and what those conditions are. Well, very good. Well, uh, I don't see any other questions showing up in the box, but I'm. Uh, thank you for offering to uh, for folks to reach out to you. Um, yeah, let me see if I can throw my email up here really quick. Since throw um, it in the chat box, there that would be yeah, great. Yeah, I can. My you can also post I'm, it. We'll post it with your seminar on our website as well. Oh, um, okay, good. Well, that'll be good because my computer, as you can tell, is moving. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, why don't you just send that to uh, Stephanie or I, and we'll make sure that we put that up available when we. The, the one you've been emailing from is okay to use. Yeah, that one's okay. that one's okay, perfect. Okay. So go ahead perfect. and do that one. But yeah, please, please, I and and don't hesitate to contact me if you have questions or anything you want to talk about this stuff because I obviously I like it. <laughs> I like talking about it. So. Um, I don't awesome. Mind well, thank you again. And um, thanks. I actually uh, work with isotopes and you did a very nice job explaining isotopes. <laughs> so I, I always appreciate people that can can explain the nitrogen and carbon fraction nation um, clearly enough to understand it. <laughs> Not everybody can how, do that. Yeah, well, I, I feel like uh, I have, in terms of graduate students, I, I feel like I have a, a spiel I, I try to go through when they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> very good. Yeah. All right. All righty. Well, well thanks thank you so much, guys. Yeah. Thanks, Dana. See y'all later. Right. See you guys.